I'm Scott Allen Miller, it's the 9th of June, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today, we're gonna to be talking about how is it that the GDP is so low in Nicaragua, yet people are able to do so much. How does that work? We're gonna to get to that right after the bump. So let's talk for a minute first about the hat. So I've been wondering why when I'm talking to you, I think I'm getting tinnitus or something because I'm doing the show and I hear this echo in my ears and it's kind of ringing. I figured out it's actually my voice bouncing off the resin rim of the hat. <laughs> Who would have guessed that that would be a thing? Uh, so GDP or gross domestic product or more importantly, a per capita gross domestic product. How does that work? How is that actually generated? And why is the GDP in some place like the United States so high and some place like Nicaragua so low and yet the people who live here are able to live decent lives? I'm not trying to downplay the fact that they are actually poor and that there are many people who are struggling and so forth. And yet even people who are living far below, far, far below the US poverty line they're still able to often eat healthily, get clothes, have a cell phone, do things, play video games, just without air conditioning and in a, a less desirable house and location. So how do they do this? If you were to do anything similar in the United States, you would literally starve to death. What's the difference? Well, to understand this, we have to talk a little bit about what a GDP actually is and how it's calculated. So let's start with a basic economy, the most basic, essentially one without an economy. You have two people, John, and Jane. They live in their two-person economy and they uh, do everything themselves. They actually don't talk to each other. They don't get along all that much. And each of them grows their own food, builds their own shelter, does all their own things, and they just don't interact. They have an economy of zero. No money is exchanged. They do survive and they may do well. The quality of their house is as good as they can build. The quality of their food is as good as they can grow and cook and so forth. There is no exchange of goods between them. If they do a little bit of trading, we don't generally measure that in, in GDP. If John was to trade some of his extra apples and Jane was to give him an extra load of lumber that she had, we would not normally calculate that under modern uh, GDP calculations because it's, it's background noise. It's, it's just goods going back and forth. Nothing's grown. It's simply people sharing resources. And this kind of makes sense. But then when we introduce money, we start getting a little bit more complicated. What if instead of trading apples for lumber, John decides to give Jane some money for her lumber, but then Jane uses that money to buy those apples from John. Well, now we put a value on those things and we calculate those two exchanges. Let's say he bought $100 of lumber and she bought $100 of apples. We then say we have a total economy of $200 in the gross domestic product. And we divide that by the number of people, which is two, and we have $100 on average per person, which is easy to see each of them received $100. So their GDP individually is $100. You say, wow, each of them made $100, which they were in turn then able to spend on something else that they wanted. So they earned $100, they spent $100. It's an interesting way of looking at the world and at first, this tends to seem logical. Oh, if there were more people, you could see if there's 10 people and each of them was buying something from one of the others, that would add up and everyone would have a larger GDP and everybody would have more things that they wanted. Great. What starts to get complicated is that in a world where you buy what you need, this tends to make a lot of sense. And Nicaragua tends to be a service-oriented economy. So it works not exactly like this, but more like this than not like this. So when you think about how much someone has or provides something that someone else wants and they pay for it, and those numbers are added up to make the GDP and then divided by the number of population to make the per capita GDP, you say, that's reasonable. I can see how that works. Now let's take the United States and look at it the same way. The US is not a traditional economy in that way. The US is a production economy. It is a uh, consumer economy, right? And what does that mean? We say that a lot. What do we actually mean? 
What we mean is that the United States focuses on making and purchasing a lot of things, things that are not needed. It doesn't mean that we don't want them, but they're things we really don't need in the way that we treat them. For example, I don't need to get a third kite for my kite collection. I don't need to have hobbies to keep myself busy that all involve buying lots of things. I don't need to go shopping as therapy. I don't need to buy new clothes just because they're interesting. I would only buy them because I needed them in a traditional economy and so forth. In America, we're taught culturally and sometimes more that it is a good thing to do to go out and spend money. The act of shopping is something you do for fun. It is a form of entertainment. The owning of things, the collecting of things, these are things that people do. The idea that you would have a collection. I mean, it's a completely reasonable thing. You can imagine going to anyone's house and finding out that they collect something. It could be porcelain vases, it could be figurines, it could be old guns, it could be World War II memorabilia, it could be newspapers, magazines, it could be artwork, you name it, they collect it. That's how we tend to work. It is a very normal thing to think when you are assigning yourself a new American person to, to I, you know, visualize. One of the things you will say is, you know, what are their hobbies and what are their collections? And we don't think about it too much, but Americans tend to collect things. And that is because we actually find consumerism, the act of shopping and buying and owning on its own to be a form of entertainment. And this is not to say that that is good or bad, but it is an activity foreign to most of the world. For most of the world, when you want to go buy something, it is because it needs to serve a task. It's okay to get a chair, because sometimes you need to sit down. It's okay to get a TV, sometimes you need to watch something. It's okay to get food, you need to eat. It's not wrong to buy things, it's not wrong to provide things. But the idea that you would shop just for the sake of shopping feels weird. The idea that you would own things and own a bigger house just so you could hold all the unnecessary things that you bought simply because you like to own extra things feels pretty weird in general. And of course, as societies get richer, they lean towards being able to buy more things and the idea that you would then collect things you don't necessarily need starts to, to arise somewhat naturally. So it's it's not to say that this is purely a, a thing of its own making, but it is a, a very interesting American behavior, and it mostly exists because you have a combination of a society that has excess wealth combined with relatively low cost or historically relatively low cost housing. Because of that is the ability to have a house full of lots of stuff isn't too hard. Growing up in the Northeast United States, we all had basements, which gave us a lot of space in which to store things that we didn't need. And everyone you ever met had a basement full of junk. Many people where I grew up in a rural area also then had a barn full of junk. We would often have barns just to collect our junk. I mean, I grew up with a sled and a, and a, a horse-drawn carriage hanging out in the, in the barn. Did we ever use them? No, but we collected them. Right? Eventually we got rid of them, but they were there for a decade at least. Weird, weird things that would simply stay there. Here in Nicaragua, if someone had something like that, you'd say, oh, do you run a business with that? Yes, I'm planning to, to give horse-drawn carriage rides. I think it's going to snow and we're, we're preparing for that, whatever. It would be a completely different thing, but to say, no, I decided that it was neat, so I kept it, would be weird. Right? It takes up space. You have to deal with that. That costs money. Even if it's just the space taking money, whatever, you could do something with that. It's weird that you don't. And so that bit of consumerism, and we're, it feels like we're getting off track, but we're not, um, really makes America quite different than other places. So let's look at this same thing from an American perspective. So you have John and Jane. Now John goes around and finds as many apples as he can that have weird shapes. And he sells them to collectors, Jane, who buys them and says, oh, these are weirdly shaped apples. And she just likes them. So she's spending money on them that she doesn't need to spend because she likes them. And likewise, John is really into interesting patterns in wood. So he buys lots of extra wood from Jane that he wouldn't actually need for anything. He just stores them in his shed, which he built out of extra wood because he likes to be able to look at the patterns or tell people that he collects these patterns. It gives him a purpose. Now they're buying things they don't need. In this example, it seems okay because you just have two people and somehow they have to generate the money to buy the thing from the other person. And so nothing has actually been added. Their actual value hasn't gone up any. 
But you'll notice that if they're each buying an apple for $10, each buying wood for $10, and they got 100 things instead of one that they needed, suddenly we're at an economy of thousands of dollars, but the actual value of nothing has changed. There's a very brave lizard running right in front of me right now. That's uh, unusual. I see them often hiding, but this one's actually just come out and is like, oh, I'm going to hang out. Yeah, he just ran all the way around me. <laughs> oh, there he goes again. He's, he's seriously just hanging out. Not, a, not an iguana, it's the other one. It's not the geckos, which are small, or the gekitos, which are really small, uh, and it's not the iguanas, which are giant. This is the in-between ones that they're fast and they run around. They tend to be in the brush. They're the ones that make the leaves rustle. No idea what they eat. Cricket kind of things is what I picture, but I don't know. So when you start getting a lot of people in the economy, you start having a lot of people doing things, some interesting things start to happen. When you just have John and Jane, it's not that big of a deal. But when you start adding people, it quickly starts to grow. So the first piece is when you're buying things you don't need. The second piece is when you have specialized skills. So in the initial example, we had just apples and wood. It doesn't take a lot of people to produce a, a bit of wood. It doesn't take a lot of people to produce an apple. Those are pretty discrete things. But what if Jane is supplying John with a house? But John's the carpenter, and he supplies the carpentry skills to build that house. But Jane is the one that supplies the wood. But John's the one that supplies the milling. And this goes on for a number of steps. Well, it doesn't take very long before Jane produces a lump of wood or a log, right? That's as we would call it. She produces a log from her trees that she cut down. John already sold her the saw, so he's already made some money. She then sells him the trunk. So she makes some money. Then he mills that trunk into lumber and she buys it from him. Then she selects the lumber that's going to be going into a particular house and John buys it from her. And then she needs that house constructed. So she buys carpentry skills from him. John needs a place to live. So he buys the completed house from Jane. Jane doesn't have anywhere to put that house yet. So she buys some land from John and so forth. And this interaction goes back and forth each time the same piece of, of item that wood is being passed back and forth and we count it each time. So suddenly two people having added nothing to the economy that they couldn't have done on their own that didn't exist before is starting to add up. And in the United States, we start to get this a lot. We have a lot of mechanisms and there's, this is not bad. This is very important to understand this is not bad. It is simply very complicated to, to track your gross domestic product in a meaningful way when you have an economy doing this. That's, that's all we're saying. And so what you have in the United States, for example, is it is common uh, for a company to buy uh, each of the parts. So let's say you're making a car. Every single piece of that car is purchased from someone. And every piece that goes into those pieces is purchased from someone. And all of the metal that goes into that is purchased from someone. And every single thing has a transaction. So in the final product, a car, you say, well, okay, we produced a $40,000 car. But that car is built out of $38,000 worth of pieces. Each one of those pieces is built out of something that costs 99% of what it costs. And so that car may have been purchased by different companies effectively dozens of times. Meaning, at the time that you end up buying a car, the purchase of that car, while only a total of $38,000 may have ever changed hands, it could be that it has changed hands many times, equaling so the GDP effectiveness of it may be 300 or 400 or $500,000 out of a $38,000 car. I say that doesn't make any sense, and you're right. It doesn't make any sense. So GDP reflects how many times things bounce around in an economy, not how much total exists in the economy. Another way to look at it is, uh, what if you bought a, purse of, a piece of furniture? Here in Nicaragua, if you buy a rocking chair, so let's say John and Jane each buy a rocking chair. Each one spends $10. The GDP for the first year that the rocking chair was purchased was a total of $20 divided by the people, $10. Then a year later, they keep those rocking chairs. Their GDP goes to zero. Nothing new has been purchased. Maybe they'll buy something else. But looking at chairs, no new chair GDP is being produced. And the next year, they just keep their chairs. If you're here in Nicaragua, your chairs are typically going to be passed down for generations. They last and they last and they last. In the United States, we have a tendency to buy some furniture, give it a couple years, and then sell it or give it away. It goes to a new person. That person uses it for a few years. They give it away. It goes to another new person, and it keeps moving down the chain. The first people do buy a new couch, but the other people do not. 
are more couches, more chairs being purchased in this American system? No, the same number are being purchased. More of them are being purchased by someone at the top of the food chain who can afford it more and the people at the very bottom are spending less. But overall, the number of chairs produced is roughly the same and it doesn't really matter until everyone's so rich that you don't need hand-me-downs that no one is willing to take hand-me-downs it doesn't matter how many you're willing to produce how much you're willing to spend because the total number of chairs existing in the economy is basically equal to the total number of butts that want to sit in them it's not going to change dramatically you could change a percentage or two but it's not going to change much if you're super affluent of course you could have a house that has a few extra chairs that no one really ever uses or maybe you have an alternative chair like I have a comfy one for when I'm lounging and a more aggressive one when I'm leaning over a desk okay so there it can grow a little but overall you're not looking at an explosive growth in chairs regardless of how affluent your economy is you're looking at maybe they'll buy more expensive chairs but in general they'll simply buy them in a different way so but the, what happens in the US system even though it's the same number of chairs or roughly is that every time they're passed on to a new person, that counts as another transaction within the gross domestic product. And so that one chair takes on a life where it's constantly being resold and resold. And yes, it depreciates. It probably won't be as sold for as much in the future, unless we classify it as an antique or it becomes a collector's item, in which case it may catch even more than it did in the future. Another example is Pokemon cards. When those Pokemon cards are first purchased, there's a whole bunch of GDP being created. We're not actually uh, uh, producing something of value, not as we normally think of it, we are producing something that is simply uh, a piece of paper with a picture on it. But because there's excess money in the economy, people are willing to spend money on those kinds of things. When you do that, uh, I just stumbled on a cashew on the ground. This is very interesting. There hasn't been a lot of cashews. Something has eaten them all, but there's one really big cashew just chilling on the ground here all by itself. When you do that, you're literally, in a way, printing money. You're printing these Pokemon cards, and people are willing to give you money for them. So because you trigger a transaction, let's say you go out and you print one million Pokemon cards, and people spend one dollar on each one. For all intents and purposes, you just printed a million dollars, not in an inflationary way, but for yourself. And that transaction moved a million dollars from people who want those cards into your company's hands. Now you have a million dollars that you didn't have before. And they have Pokemon cards worth a million dollars that they didn't have before. As far as they're concerned, they got more for their value. That's why they made the transaction. As far as you're concerned, you also got more for your value. That's why you did the transaction. Everyone feels like they've gained. But someone looking from the outside would say, you've produced nothing and nothing's happened. And if you look at this from any kind of global scale, there's no change in value. Just a whole bunch of work was done with no outcome. Now, you go, can go spend that money on something, right? You can go buy a new TV. You can go buy a new car. That purchase that you get to make with that money now counts again for the GDP. And again, when you buy that $38,000, $40,000 car, it may count for $300,000 of GDP. So you just printed a million dollars of GDP and use it at each thing that you purchase may represent more than a whole dollar. Again, you may produce millions and millions of dollars of GDP growth. And at the end of the day, the only new thing added to the economy was some paper, things printed on paper. This makes it really interesting for how the GDP works, but now you have all these people who are collecting these Pokemon cards. What if they start trading them with each other? Every trade counts as another GDP growth. So let's say all million people at some point trade their card once, even if they just shuffle it around. Well, that million dollars just became $2 million. Now what if some of those become collector's items and they sell them to someone? Well, now it became $10 million. What if those collectors share between each other? Now it's $100 million. Those numbers can grow and grow and grow, and you say, what is the actual increase to the economy? Nothing. We have nothing new to use, nothing new to have, nothing new, nothing's made the economy bigger, and yet our GDP number feels huge. So when you list it, say, what is your GDP of your economy? You can say, well, we have, we have hundreds of millions of dollars. Really, what do you produce? What do you have to show for it? Everyone's starving to death. No one has money. The only thing we do is every day we get together and we trade Pokemon cards. And at some point, here's an experiment. If you give each person one dollar and one Pokemon card and say you have to share, you have to buy and sell every day or as fast as you can every minute, you could have a, a ring of 100 people just moving dollars to the right and Pokemon cards to the left. 
as fast as they could. And in a day, you would have hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it, but at the end, the only thing you've done is keep those people busy buying and selling the same things to each other. You have the same number of Pokemon cards, the same number of dollars, but your GDP could be enormous all in one day. Do that on a global economy scale where everyone's buying and selling the same goods over and over again between them and the numbers start getting really big. The other thing that happens is inflation hits. And so what we end up with inflation is that, so you can look at it with milk and bread, but those things are different. They tend to reflect the value of currency. But when it comes to the inflation of products, we have the, the capability of something like a Pokemon card being revaluated. What if we took that same ring of people and instead of having them do $1 and one card, pass it around, have it be a hundred dollars and one card. So it doesn't take very much to see how by inflating the value of the things we're trading and by trading them back and forth frequently between the same people or a group of people, we can artificially inflate the size of an economy really quickly in a completely meaningless way. As another example, let's take two really concrete people who could do this for fun if they thought it would be funny. Elon Musk, and Bill Gates, they could take their stocks that they currently have, come up with an amount of Tesla, an amount of Microsoft that's roughly equal in value, say half a trillion dollars each, and trade it with each other. Just straight up trade, one for one, no one's making any money, no one's any the wiser, the, the, the other shareholders are not affected, the employees are not affected, simply two rich people swapping which companies they own in equal value amounts that would increase the U.S. economy by one trillion dollars. Now imagine if they thought for fun they would do this back and forth ad nauseum and they simply did it a hundred times a day or a hundred times a second just through trading algorithms. They could do that and new trading systems actually do this in the United States. They trade systems back and forth very rapidly because they see different value at different times in different systems and different systems have different decision-making algorithms and so things get traded around potentially quite a lot very quickly, sometimes below the millisecond range. If you did that with just these two people, not the entire economy, just these two people, you could create trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars of GDP and nothing would actually change in the economy and no one anywhere would be able to tell that any of this had happened unless you're taxing it and then of course the government would make all kinds of money and all the money would vanish. But as long as they're doing a non-tax transaction that simply could happen as many times and you could say after the fact well we traded it two times or 200 times or a hundred trillion times. And no one would know because you wouldn't necessarily need to record them and it's all completely meaningless. And this is the problem with GDPs is once you start having transactions like this in any way or anything that mimics this, you start to have a meaningless number. What is a GDP? It doesn't make any difference. So it's really easy to see once you realize that that can and does happen. The fact that it does happen every day in the United States is very important. Because of that, we know that the, the actual buying power, the actual effect of the GDP, it doesn't mean what we think it means in the US. And it's easy to see how a place like the US will end up with a very large number that's overinflated compared to normal. And a place like Nicaragua, where we tend not to buy things we don't need, we tend not to trade things, we don't trade businesses in that way, stocks are not shared back and forth, where people do not tend to do trickle down uh, products throughout the economy, buying at the top and trick trickling down, people buy and keep for generations, and people don't buy surplus. When you do all those things and you, and you take away extreme on one side and add extreme on the other, it's really easy to see how one is overinflated and one is underinflated compared to what they actually represent. Because of this, it explains a lot of why Americans with the world's one of the world's highest GDPs are often unable to buy dinner, are unable to buy basic things, can't afford to do so many things. And Nicaraguans with one of the world's lowest GDPs seem to be able to buy so much more with their money, are able to do so many more things, not just that all these things, it's also that in the United States there's this inflation of products. So something like a Pokemon card, if you made something like that that's popular, it could make hundreds or thousands of dollars per, ca per card. And in Nicaragua, the same thing would only get to five dollars per card. And so the, even if you trade the same thing a hundred times, they're inflated one compared to the other, but you're still dealing with something printed on paper and people trading it back and forth. The actual effects of the economy are, are the same. 
And so uh, using that, we have to understand GDP in that way. And suddenly it becomes a, oh, that really can be a meaningless number if we're not comparing uh, apples to apples. And in this case, we're not. We're comparing apples to bitter lemons, right, to, to bitter oranges, to something totally different that we're not expecting. Because the way that the US economy works is so extreme in one way, and Nicaragua is so extreme in the other, that it's often difficult to compare them because they're doing totally different things. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe if you'd like to help support this channel and increase my personal GDP. Just hit this link above and buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. If you'd like to uh, engage us for help in relocating to Nicaragua, we have a business that does that. We'd love to reach out and talk to you. Just hit it, shoot us up with an email. That is not an expression. Shoot an email to us, info at relocatenicaragua.com. Like and subscribe, share on social media, tell your friends, and I will see all of you tomorrow.